Hey, hey, you're listening to Uncanny Japan. I'm Teresa Matsura, and because it's Obon, festival for the dead season, today I'm going to share with you a cool essay by Lafcadio Hearn, a piece I stumbled across and don't know how I didn't know about it earlier, because it's written about the town I've lived in for over 25 years. Usually when I read Lafcadio Hearn stories here or on Patreon, they're his fiction retellings of folktales he heard while living here. But he didn't only write fiction, he was also a great journalist, and I've always found his observations fun and fascinating. So for today, let me read you Lafcadio Hearn's essay about Yaizu. I know Yaizu. So it's fascinating to hear his descriptions of it while staying here in the summer during Obon. I just love how he culminates and connects the ocean, music, gods, and ghosts, and how we humble humans fit into it all. After I finish, I'll make a couple of comments about how things have changed or how they've stayed the same. Uncanny Japan is author me, Teresa Matsura, exploring all that is weird from old Japan. Strange superstitions and old wives' tales cultural oddities and interesting language quirks. These are little treasures I dig up while doing research for my writing, and I want to share them with you here on Uncanny Japan. I hope you like the show. First off, I want to thank all my glorious patrons. Remember, I have that goal to reach 300 by the end of the year. Well, as of this moment, we're up to 235. So I wanted to give a great big arigato gozaimasu to all of you. And I just remembered that I haven't mentioned it here, but I've enabled yearly patronage. So you can pay for 11 months of whichever tier you like and get the 12th month free. And some other wicked good news. Uncanny Japan was just nominated for three categories at the New Jersey Web Fest for the Tanuki Buttons episode. We're up for Outstanding Comedy, Best Series Premise and Narrative Fiction, and Best Leading Performance. Those will all be voted on in mid-September, and while Richard and I are encouraged to fly back and attend, and it does look like it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're vaccinated and we are always wearing our masks anyway, we just spent all of our money on the last trip. So we will be biting our nails and crossing our fingers in front of a computer come the awards ceremony. And we'll let you know how it turns out. On to today's show. Since this one is about my little port city, Yaizu, we hoofed it down to the rocky shore you're fixing to hear about to record some summer waves. Talk about magic. You can close your eyes. Listen to Lafcadio Hearn's essay about Obon and the sea while experiencing the exact same ocean he did around 120 years ago. So let's get started. At Yaizu. Under a bright sun, the old fishing town of Yaizu has a particular charm of neutral color. Lizard-like, it takes the gray tents of the rude gray coast on which it rests. Curving along a little bay, it is sheltered from the heavy seas by an extraordinary rampart of boulders. This rampart on the waterside is built in the form of terrace steps, the rounded stones of which it is composed being kept in position by a sort of basketwork woven between rows of stakes driven deeply into the ground. A separate row of stakes sustaining each of the grades. Looking landward from the top of the structure, your gaze ranges over the whole town. A broad space of gray tiled roofs and weather-worn gray timbers, with here and there a pine grove marking the place of a temple court. Seaward, over leagues of water, there is a grand view. A jagged blue range of peaks crowding sharply into the horizon, like prodigious amethysts, and beyond them, to the left, the glorious specter of Fuji, towering enormously above everything. Between seawall and sea, there is no sand, 
only a gray slope of stones, chiefly boulders, and these roll with the surf so that it is ugly work trying to pass the breakers on a rough day. If you once get struck by a stone wave, as I did several times, you will not soon forget the experience. At greater hours, the greater part of this rough slope is occupied by ranks of strange-looking craft, fishing boats of a form peculiar to this locality. They are very large, capable of carrying 40 or 50 men each, and they have queer, high prows to which Buddhist or Shinto charms, mamori or shugo, are usually attached. A common form of Shinto written charm, shugo, is furnished for this purpose from the temple of the goddess of Fuji. The text reads, Fujisan chojo sengengu daigyo manzoku, meaning that the owner of the boat pledges himself, in case of good fortune at fishing, to perform great austerities in honor of the divinity whose shrine is upon the summit of Fuji. In every coast province of Japan, and even at different fishing settlements of the same province, the forms of boats and fishing implements are peculiar to the district or settlement. Indeed, it will sometimes be found that settlements, within a few miles of each other, respectively manufacture nets or boats as dissimilar in type as might be the inventions of races living thousands of miles apart. This amazing variety may be in some degree due to respect for local tradition, to the pious conservatism that preserves ancestral teaching and custom unchanged through hundreds of years. But it is better explained by the fact that different communities practice different kinds of fishing, and the shapes of the nets or the boats made at any one place are likely to prove on investigation the inventions of a special experience. The big yaizu boats illustrate this fact. They were devised according to the particular requirements of the yaizu fishing industry, which supplies dried katsuo, bonito, to all parts of the empire. And it was necessary that they should be able to ride a very rough sea. To get them in or out of the water is a heavy job. But the whole village helps. A kind of slipway is improvised in a moment by laying flat wooden frames on the slope in a line. And over these frames, the flat bottom vessels are hauled up and down by means of long ropes. You will see a hundred or more persons thus engaged in moving a single boat. Men, women, and children pulling together in time to a curious melancholy chant. At the coming of a typhoon, the boats are moved far back into the streets. There is plenty of fun in helping at such work. And if you are a stranger, the fisher folk will perhaps reward your pains by showing you the wonders of the sea. Crabs with legs of astonishing length, balloon fish that blow themselves up in the most absurd manner, and various other creatures of shapes so extraordinary that you can scarcely believe them natural without touching them. The big boats with holy texts at their prows are not the strongest objects on the beach. Even more remarkable are the bait baskets of split bamboo, baskets six feet high and 18 feet around, with one small hole in the dome-shaped top, ranged along the seawall to dry, they might at some distance be mistaken for habitations or huts of some sort. Then you see great wooden anchors shaped like plowshares and shod with metal, iron anchors, with four flukes, prodigious wood mallets used for driving stakes, and various other implements still more unfamiliar, of which you cannot even imagine the purpose. The indescribable antique queerness of everything gives you that weird sensation of remoteness, of the far away in time and place, which makes one doubt the reality of the visible. And the life of Yaizu is certainly the life of many centuries ago.
The people, too, are the people of old Japan. Frank and kindly as children, good children, honest to a fault, innocent of the further world, loyal to the ancient traditions and the ancient gods. I happened to be in Yaizu during the three days of the Obon, or Festival for the Dead, and I hope to see the beautiful farewell ceremony of the third and last day. In many parts of Japan, the ghosts are furnished with miniature ships for their voyage, little models of junks or fishing craft, each containing offerings of food and water and kindled incense. Also, a tiny lantern or lamp if the ghost ship be dispatched at night. But at Yaizu, lanterns only are set afloat, and I was told that they would be launched after dark, Midnight being the customary hour elsewhere. I suppose that it was the hour of farewell at Yaizu also, and I rashly indulged in a nap after supper, expecting to wake up in time for the spectacle. But by ten o'clock, when I went to the beach again, all was over, and everybody had gone home. Over the water, I saw something like a swarm of fireflies. The lanterns drifting out to sea in procession. But they were already too far to be distinguished except as points of colored light. I was much disappointed. I felt that I had lazily missed an opportunity which might never again return. For these old bone customs are dying rapidly. But in another moment it occurred to me that I could very well venture to swim out to the lights, which were moving slowly. I dropped my robe on the beach and plunged in. The sea was calm and beautifully phosphorescent. Every stroke kindled a stream of yellow fire. I swam fast and overtook the last of the lantern fleet much sooner than I had hoped. I felt that it would be unkind to interfere with the little embarkations or divert them from their silent course. So I contented myself with keeping close to one of them and studying its details, the lights of the dead. The structure was very simple. The bottom was a piece of thick plank, perfectly square and measuring about ten inches across. Each one of its corners supported a slender stick about sixteen inches high, and these four uprights, united above by cross pieces, sustained the paper sides. Upon the point of a long nail driven up through the center of the bottom was fixed a lighted candle. The top was left open. The four sides presented five different colors blue, yellow, red, white, and black. These five colors, respectively, symbolizing ether, wind, fire, water, and earth. The five Buddhist elements, which are metaphysically identified with the five Buddhas. One of the paper panes was red, one blue, one yellow, and the right half of the fourth plane was black, while the left half, uncolored, represented white. No kaimyo was written upon any of the transparencies. Inside the lantern, there was only a flickering candle. I watched those frail, glowing shapes drifting through the night, and ever as they drifted, scattering under the impulse of wind and wave, more and more widely apart. Each with its quiver of color seemed a life afraid, trembling on the blind current that was bearing it into the outer blackness. Are not we ourselves as lanterns launched upon a deeper and dimmer sea, and ever spreading further and further from one another, as we drift to the inevitable dissolution. Soon the thought light in each burns itself out. Then the poor frames and all that is left of their once fair colors must melt forever into the colorless void. Even in the moment of this musing, I began to doubt whether I was really alone, to ask myself whether there might not be something more than a mere shuddering of life in the thing that rocked beside me, some presence that haunted the dying flame, 
and was watching the watcher. A faint cold thrill passed over me, perhaps some chill uprising from the depths, perhaps the creeping only of a ghostly fancy. Old superstitions of the coast recurred to me, old vogue warnings of peril in the time of the passage of souls. I reflected that were any evil to befall me out there in the night, meddling or seeming to meddle, with the lights of the dead, I should myself furnish the subject of some future weird legend. I whispered the Buddhist formula of farewell to the lights and made speed for shore. As I touched the stones again, I was startled by seeing two white shadows before me, but a kindly voice asking if the water was cold set me at ease. It was the voice of my old landlord, Otokichi, the fish seller, who had come to look for me, accompanied by his wife. Only pleasantly cool, I made answer, as I threw on my robe to go home with them. Ah, said the wife, it is not good to go out there on the night of the bone. I did not go far, I replied. I only wanted to look at the lanterns. Even a kappa gets drowned sometimes, protested Okichi. There was a man of the village who swam home a distance of seven neat in bad weather, after his boat had been broken, but he was drowned afterwards. This is a common proverb. Kappa mo obore shini. The kappa is a water goblin, haunting rivers especially. Seven li means a trifle less than 18 miles. I asked if any of the young men now in the settlement could do as much. Probably some might, the old man replied. There are many strong swimmers all swim here, even the little children. But when fisher folk swim like that, it is only to save their lives. Or to make love, the wife added, like the Hashima girl. Who? queried I. A fisherman's daughter, said Otokichi. She had a lover in Ajiro, several li distant. And she used to swim to him at night and swim back in the morning. He kept a light burning to guide her. But one dark night, the light was neglected or blown out, and she lost her way and was drowned. The story is famous in Izu. So, I said to myself, in the Far East, it is poor Hero that does the swimming. And what, under such circumstances, would have been the Western estimate of Leander? Usually, about the time of a bone, the sea gets rough and I was not surprised to find the next morning that the surf was running high. All day it grew. By the middle of the afternoon, the waves had become wonderful, and I sat on the sea wall and watched them until sundown. It was a long, slow rolling, massive and formidable. Sometimes, just before breaking, a towering swell would crack all its green length with a tinkle as of shivering glass then would fall and flatten with a peal that shook the wall beneath me. I thought of the great dead Russian general who made his army to storm as a sea, wave upon wave of steel, thunder following thunder. There was yet scarcely any wind, but there must have been wild weather elsewhere, and the breakers were steadily heightening. Their motion fascinated. How indescribably complex such a motion is, yet how eternally new. Who could fully describe even five minutes of it? No mortal ever saw two waves break in exactly the same way. And probably no mortal ever watched the ocean roll or heard its thunder without feeling serious. I have noticed that even animals, horses and cows, become meditative in the presence of the sea. They stand and stare and listen as if the sight and sound of that immensity made them forget all else in the world. There is a folk saying of the coast, the sea has a soul and hears. And the meaning is thus explained, never speak of your fear when you feel afraid at sea. If you say that you are afraid, the waves will suddenly rise higher. Now, this imagining seems to me absolutely natural. I must confess that when I am either in the sea or upon it, I cannot fully persuade myself that it is not alive, a conscious and hostile power. 
Reason, for the time being, avails nothing against this fancy. In order to be able to think of the sea as a mere body of water, I must be upon some height from whence its heaviest billing appears but a lazy creeping of tiny ripples. But the primitive fancy may be roused even more strongly in darkness than by daylight. How living seem the smolderings and the flashings of the tide on the nights of phosphorescence. How reptilian the subtle shifting of the tints of its chilly flame. Dive into such a night sea, open your eyes in the black-blue gloom, and watch the weird gush of lights that follow your every motion, each luminous point as seen through the flood, like the opening and closing of an eye. At such a moment, one feels indeed as if enveloped by some monstrous sentency, suspended within some vital substance that feels and sees and wills alike in every part, an infinite, soft, cold ghost. Long I lay awake at night and listened to the thunder rolls and crashings of the mighty tide, deeper than these distinct shocks of noise and all the storming of the nearer waves, was the base of the further surf, a ceaseless, abysmal muttering to which the building trembled, a sound that seemed to imagination like the sound of the trampling of infinite calvary, the massing of incalculable artillery, some rushing from the sunrise of armies wide as the world. Then I found myself thinking of the vague terror with which I had listened, when a child, to the voice of the sea, And I remembered that, after years, on different coasts and different parts of the world, the sound of surf had always revived the childish emotion. Certainly this emotion was older than I by thousands of thousands of centuries. The inherited sum of numberless terrors ancestral. But presently there came to me the conviction that fear of the sea alone could represent but one element of the multitudinous awe awakened by its voice. For as I listened to that wild tide of the Suraga coast, I could distinguish nearly every sound of fear known to man. Not merely noises of battle tremendous or interminable volleying, of immeasurable charging, but of the roaring of beast, the crackling and hissing of fire, the rumbling of earthquake, the thunder of ruin, and above all these, a clamor continual as the shrieks of smothered shoutings, the voices that are said to be the voices of the drowned, awfulness supreme of tumult, combining all imaginable echoings of fury and destruction and despair. And to myself I said, is it wonderful that the voice of the sea should make us serious? Consonantly to its multiple utterance must respond all waves of immemorial fear that move in the vaster sea of soul experience. Deep calleth unto sea. The visible abyss calls to that abyss invisible of elder being whose flood flow made the ghosts of us. Wherefore, there is surely more than a little truth in the ancient belief that the speech of the dead is the roar of the sea. Truly the fear and the pain of the dead past speak to us in that dim, deep awe which the roar of the sea awakens. But there are sounds that move us much more profoundly than the voice of the sea can do, and in stranger ways, sounds that also make us serious at times, and very serious. Sounds of music. Great music is a psychical storm, agitating to unimaginable depth the mystery of the past within us. Or we might say that it is the prodigious incantation, every different instrument and voice making separate appeal to different billions of prenatal memories. There are tones that call up all ghosts of youth and joy and tenderness. There are tones that evoke a phantom pain of perished passion. There are tones that resurrect all dead sensations of majesty and might and glory, all expired exultations, all forgotten magnanimities. Well may the influence of music seem inexplicable to the man who idly dreams that his life began less than a hundred years ago. 
But the mystery lightens for whomsoever learns that the substance of self is older than the sun. He finds that music is a necromancy. He feels that to every ripple of melody, to every billow of harmony, there answers within him out of the sea of death and birth some eddying immeasurable of ancient pleasure and pain. Pleasure and pain. They commingle always in great music. And therefore it is that music can move us more profoundly than the voice of ocean or any other voice can do. But in music's larger utterance, it is ever the sorrow that makes the undertone, the surf mutter of the sea of soul. Strange to think how vast the sum of joy and woe that must have been experienced before the sense of music could evolve in the brain of man. Somewhere it is said that human life is the music of the gods, that its sobs and laughter, its songs and shrieks and orisons, its outcries of delight and of despair, rise never to the hearing of the immortals but as a perfect harmony. Wherefore they could not desire to hush the tones of pain. It would spoil their music. The combination without the agony tones would prove a discord unendurable to ears divine. And in one way we ourselves are as gods, since it is only the sum of the pains and the joys of past lives innumerable that makes for us, through memory organic, the ecstasy of music. All the gladness and the grief of dead generations come back to haunt us in countless forms of harmony and of melody. Even so, a million years after we shall have ceased to view the sun, will the gladness and the grief of our own lives pass with richer music into other hearts, there to bestir for one mysterious moment some deep and exquisite thrilling a voluptuous pain. The end. Okay, now for some comments. He's right. There is no sand on the beaches of Yaizu, just rocks. I wouldn't call them boulders, more like dark gray rocks that roll and crackle in rough weather and are indeed no fun to walk across. I'm really surprised he talked about swimming in the water here. Except for a very narrow inlet area called Hamatome, these days people don't swim off the Yaizu coast. I was always warned by my mother-in-law never ever to swim or even to step a bare foot into the sea. She explained how the ocean floor falls away very quickly and extremely deeply, and also the water itself is very unpredictable. I didn't realize, but yes, the Mariana Trench is also out that way as well as all sorts of freaky-looking deep, deep-sea creatures, which I think is exactly what Mr. Hearn was talking about when he says that he was shown fish with extraordinary shapes. Also, we don't have those big rowboats going out anymore except on special occasions. Real ships to catch Katsuo, of course. That's still a thing. If you're lucky, you can see the ships come in and unload their holes full of frozen fish. I once saw a frozen tuna as big as a, I don't know, a, a large sheep, slide off a pile of fish in the back of a truck and hit the ground. It didn't explode, but that must have been worth thousands of dollars. And I'm wondering how they got it back into the truck. As for Obon, in my 25 plus years here, I've seen many small streams and rivers where lanterns were floated down, but never in the ocean. And speaking of the ocean, I just love his description of it. And when he talks about watching and listening to it and all the sounds, the roaring beast, the crackling, hissing fire, I felt this was so spot on. For most of my life, except for a brief stint in the Midwest, I've lived near the sea and I adore the ocean, although it tried to kill me once. So I just love his darkly romantic take on it and human life being music for the gods. It's all quite lovely. So on that meditative, somber note, I will let you go, and I will talk to you again in two weeks. Thank you so much for listening. 
You've just reached the end of another episode of Uncanny Japan. Perhaps you'd like more. A monthly folktale translated and retold by me. The occasional binarily mic'd soundscape like the ones you hear on the show. Or recipes, behind the curtain episodes, homemade postcards, and more. If you're interested in that or supporting the show in any way, please search for Uncanny Japan and Patreon. We've got a wonderful group over there. Thank you again for listening, supporting, reviewing, and telling your friends about the show. My name is Teresa Matsura, and I will talk to you again soon.